slowly let more people trickle in, but I'll start by giving uh, both Brian and I an introduction. So let's get started. Um, my name is Austin Iveson. I'm a solution architect at SUSE. Uh, this is Brian Six, my contemporary. He'll be walking around helping you guys out in case there's any kind of like troubleshooting issues because we do run into those every now and then. Um, and so kind of just talk about the agenda for today. Uh, the objectives we have, so this is going to be surrounding kind of like the basic concepts of containers and therefore Kubernetes orchestration, which is container orchestration. So uh, we'll start off by going over some basics, cover some architecture, both within Kubernetes concepts, and then, you know, once I'm done giving you guys a nice little slide show, we will actually get our hands dirty. We have some uh, instances that we'll be spinning up for you in the cloud, and you can actually hop in and deploy your own Kubernetes cluster, as well as um, our rancher tool and so forth. So just to get, give you some forewarning, um, this is not intended by any means to be something that you use in production. The environments we're spinning up are singular nodes, so there is no resiliency, there's no highly available aspects. Don't copy and paste this exact situation essentially and take it to like a production environment. You will have a bad time. Um, but it is a really fun lab environment. So by all means, like if you follow along with the scenario and then take those steps and put them into your own little home lab, you can absolutely do that. I do that myself, obviously. So just some prerequisites, um, up-to-date browser, make sure you're, you're using either Chrome, based or Mozilla Firefox. Safari, for instance, has issues, so don't, don't do that. All right, any questions to start off? Cool, cool, cool. Oh, question. Oh. Yeah, how you would set that. That is a conversation, I can kind of like get into that. There will be more like high level conversation um, surrounding the architecture for something that would be within production, just within like the slides and then with what I show you. Um, it's actually not many more steps, so yeah, and we'll touch on that, so thanks. Okay, so containers are great, they're fantastic, they allow for an immutable system that can be deployable anywhere, it's consistent, think of it as like a, a file system with a read-only and a, a write-only layer, so um, because of the, the simplicity of it all, you actually just have your application's code and you have dependencies. You package that into what we call a container image. image. And so again, you're going to have a container and then the container runtime takes that read-only file layer and puts a read-write layer on top of it. And so therefore, you can deploy it anywhere and it's going to be consistent. So to what building an image, a container image looks like, uh, we'll start off with this. So in the very first page, or very first spot, this is a Docker file. We are referencing where we're going to get this container image from, so the base image. Um, the latest version is going to be the Ubuntu container image. Um, we can add labels, so maintainer equals this, and then we can add some run commands, um, at git update, et cetera. We're gonna install Apache on there, and we're going to set things like the working directory and so forth. So what this essentially does down at the bottom, we're exposing a web server uh, to serve on port 80. So that's what this container does from the git, and that's what it will do the moment you deploy it. So how do we run containers? Um, a container image, right, is going to be referenced, and these little arrows would reference such things as like a Docker run. And when you do Docker run, it takes that container image and deploys containers. So um, the Docker run command is obviously gonna take that image, runs the container. Again, the images are immutable, so a single source of truth, and so forth. So, again, they're portable. It allows for the build application of, and all the dependencies to be deployed once and anywhere. Um, launching a new container of the same image guarantees a clean runtime environment. When you start a container, and it will be the same state in each of those containers, so. Perfect. This is kind of the architecture of what it looks like to have some containerized applications. We're going to compare ourselves to some traditional workloads there on the left, your left, my right. Um, and then on the uh, right side, we have the containerized applications. So what we've done 
or well, what containers have done, they've essentially made the host operating system a layer just like the hypervisors. So, you know, we've got the infrastructure that stays the same, but instead of having guest operating systems, we actually just make one singular operating system. We deploy a container runtime. This example is going to be Docker. There's other things like container D, et cetera. Um, and that actually goes ahead and directs the building of those containers. So we need a place to store container images. Uh, so a common registry is going to be a Docker Hub. So these container images are stored within here, and this is when you can start running commands to either, you know, pull an image down, push an image into the registry, um, and then if you run an image and it hasn't been pulled already, it will do that automatically. So, yeah, there's some other tools that you can apply to container registries, such as like Artifactory, Quay, um, some options, or sorry, those are repositories themselves. You can deploy such tools as like Trivi, et cetera, inside of your container registries to provide some scanning, but this is just some examples of what container registries look like. Hey, Austin, real quick, do we have a slide on microservices at all? We don't. So go back to the, the, the virtual machine comparison. So there was a, a, a decision that was made, a bunch of guys sat around developing software one day and said, there has to be a better way to do it. And as a developer myself, I wish this would have been something I thought of years ago because it would have started this whole thing a long time ago. But the idea behind a microservice was instead of building an application the way we had always done where you would build it on your, on your think of Word, Microsoft Word, for example. It's one big giant program. The thesaurus, the spell checker, the, uh, the thing that tracks how many words and, and counts them together and does your, 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 your checks your, your English syntax and all that. So Word is this big giant thing. Well, somebody sat down or a group of people sat down and said, you know what, there's got to be a better way. Because when one of those things blows up, the entire thing shuts down and it dies. So how can we do this better? So they came up with this idea of microservices. Let's make Word not just one program, but 30. Let's break it up into a whole bunch of really teeny pieces. And we'll call them microservices. Makes sense. And instead of, of course, there's a downside to this. Instead of you launching one program called Word, you have to launch 37 of them to make Word work. And oh, and one of them happens to be the user interface to Word. But they're all different. And they will all talk to each other, each other over an IP connection. They do not have this in-memory capability that we would normally have with an application where I can talk to things that were compiled in memory together. We're, like all of us in this room could be a single program together, but we talk to each other over an IP connection. And this is, imp this is important because a whole different world from just loading it up on top of an operating system as a singular thing. Imagine over here that all of those said app A. Forget app B, C, D, and E. All of those were responsible to make app A work. But the beauty in having them all separated is that they all have their own life cycle. They do not all go from version 4 to version 5 at the same time. So the UI could go to version 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but the spell checker doesn't have to. There may not be much new to add to the spell checker. Or the thesaurus can go through a bunch of revs. None of it is relying on, it, on everybody. And you build in the notion that everybody else has died. If I can't talk to my other counterparts, don't just blow up and blue screen and leave me hanging. S give me a message. Can't talk to the spell checker. Don't do that right now. Can't get to the thesaurus. Don't do that right now. Oh, the thesaurus is back online. Yay, everybody's happy. So we're microservice-based. We're IP-based. So we're all talking to each other over IP. And there's some resiliency in it. The notion that I can just restart the spell checker if it stops. And nobody else has to know. So I can get upgrades faster. 
I can, I can as, as a developer, I can push things out to my customers way faster. If I'm a developer, I can just develop my own little piece here. I don't have to worry about what everybody else is doing. Because all you're doing is you're coming to me with, uh, with a request over IP. Now, IP becomes important. And managing now, think of it, if all of us were part of this program that made this application work, someone has to orchestrate for everybody to start, to monitor everybody's IP address. Are you alive? Are you working? And if you've not, restart you. So there are some challenges, you know, because as an administrator of the IT department, I now have to worry about all of you instead of just the one singular word.exe that I used to have before. So containers got really popular. Microservices got really popular. And therefore, they spun into this notion of a container because now I'm going to take the application, a little bit of the operating system that's needed to run that part of the application, and I'm going to build a little bubble around it and say, here is your container. Austin was just telling you, it can run everywhere, wherever a container runtime exists. So wherever there's a container runtime, I can plop this thing down and it'll run. It'll spin up and it has all the things it needs. Each one of these can have its own version of, you know, PHP or Python. Every one of us can have our own versions of what we need because this is how we built. Maybe I'm a Java programmer and, and maybe someone else is different. Someone else uses Python or PHP. Build it your way. Create this container that has everything in it to make it run and then set it free. And off it goes. And it can run anywhere I've got a container runtime. And the term container runtime is very important. We'll talk about what that means as we go through this. But this is sort of this idea of why we're doing this at all. Because it's a better way to program. I can develop and get things out faster. Everybody's revving at their own speed. We're not waiting on everybody else. Don't have to. Okay. Well said. So yeah, exactly, and so if you have a couple of those containers, um, it's really easy to manage, but once you start having a whole bunch of these, you know, essentially microservices is what Brian was referencing, it becomes quite an issue. And so back in 2015, a team at Google wanted to address this, and they, um, you know, there was a lot of competition out there. I think Docker Swarm was also a container orchestration tool, but uh, Kubernetes became the de facto standard for container orchestration. Um, it's a powerful open source tool, it's extensible, and it allows us to manage all of those workloads. So, um, it's declarative syntax, so you state in the code, I want these amount of replicas to be running, and Kubernetes actually takes care of the automation of that and checks through you know, certain controllers whether or not these deployments of containers are working, and we can actually go through that. Because um, Kubernetes, everything is a resource, uh, one thing that I like to reference is it is all API driven. So, you know, CRUD uh, is essentially built into Kubernetes. So create, uh, retrieve, update, delete those resources, et cetera. And so now we can kind of talk about what Kubernetes looks like from an architecture standpoint. Uh, the smallest deployable unit of Kubernetes is a pod. So this is going to be where those said containers exist now. So we've gone up a layer, right? We now have containers, and then uh, on top of that, inside of Kubernetes, we have pods. Pods will either have a singular container running, maybe another, uh, another container called like a sidecar, et cetera. Um, and this is going to be where you know, your applications live. They each have a unique IP address, so that's something to note, and we can show you what that looks like here in a moment. Quick. So why might you think it'd be interesting to have a pod that has multiple containers in it? You can simplify um, how they communicate with each other and how they're addressed. So interesting, interesting answer. Yeah. So to simplify the communication, everybody should be going over IP. But let me let me just. Uh, he's got an answer real quick. Yours. Yep, yep. So sometimes there are these, um, gosh, they have a name for them. Yeah, yeah, the init containers, the init containers that spin up, that sort of prep things for you. Uh, the other notion is maybe these two things should always go together. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of different reasons why they may need to be, in, be together. But, so the idea would be 
We have this little microservice application that we put into the container. The container is, the, is sort of the operating system, the base operating system, and everything that makes it work. And now we've added the pod layer. And the pod layer is very Kubernetes speak. That's a Kubernetes term. But it encompasses a single or multiple containers and provides you know, some structure to it. And, and as he was saying, very declarative. So if I am building the software, if I'm deploying the software, I can declare, because it's declarative, I want 37 copies of the UI to be available, because I think there's going to be a lot of people using it. Right? Nothing possible in the previous world of deploying applications. You could never say, I want 35 versions of the same interface running, but nothing else, just the, just the UI. You can't do that. It's, just, it's all part of one thing. But with this, I can say I want 35 of the UI running, and I want 27 of, the, of, the, of our example earlier, of the thesaurus running, and 18 spell checkers, because that seems to scale with what we're building. And you can do all kinds of cool things. So it's declarative. You tell it, here's how I want everything to look. You go do it. And you keep that up. You maintain that. You monitor the failures, and you maintain the numbers that I give you. Kind of an interesting approach, but it's great from an administrator standpoint, because I just say, here it is, let Kubernetes take care of making sure the environment matches what I tell it. Yeah, and uh, to kind of like segue into that, so for instance, uh, you know, the nomenclature surrounding Kubernetes uh, deployments is essentially going to be pods. Uh, it's an abstraction on top of pods, so it takes a group of them and it monitors them through the deployment controller of the replicas, and I can actually show you what that looks like via code, so this is, um, on the left here, we have yet another manifest language, YAML. I'm sure you, some of you may have heard of it. Um, and we define what this deployment is going to look like. So it has deployment is the kind. It has the replicas, so it's going to have three of those running. And then down there in the spec and containers, if you can't see that in the back, it says spec containers, and you actually define the containers image. So this is going to be an Nginx deployment, and it's going to... Uh, be versioned at 1.7.9, um, and et cetera. And so the deployment is monitored by the Kubernetes API, and it makes sure that it has all of those, deploy those pods up and ready. Um, so this is you know, a representation of what those pods are doing. The API is monitoring it, sending information to the controller, and saying, oh no, one of your containers crashed. Let's just kill it and bring it back up automatically. And so then it will do that for you. And so then it's making sure that it's meeting that uh, resiliency with the three replicas and so on. So to talk about more pieces within Kubernetes, we now have services. So these are going to be an abstraction on top of the logical set of pods. So these give addresses to, the, um, to access pods. There's such things as cluster API for um, you know, communication within the cluster, the Kubernetes cluster. Um, node port, which can expose outside traffic to a singular node, so the host. Um, and then we also have like load balancers, can expose services on a cloud provider, uh, and et cetera. So to kind of demonstrate. So real quick, um, the, the, the cool thing about services, uh, in the previous slide, Remember how, he, how he, he, he kind of killed all the pods and then he just regenerated themselves? Well, if I do that, what happens to all of the IP addresses that were assigned? What happened to all the connections? What happened to all the things that knew about the old pods? How do they find them? So they came up with this idea of called a service. Well, we'll just create these things called services, and here's what's really cool. They're not really objects. They're just these things we'll make up in our head. We'll call them services, and we'll maintain a list of what's supposed to be out there and who's trying to talk to it. And then will be the by, it will be sort of that, that interface between what you need to know about and how to talk to it and what's really running. And so we'll abstract a lot of this way. In fact, Kubernetes abstracts a whole host of things away from you so you don't have to worry about it. But services are very cool because they keep you from having to know when there's a failure, well, where did it go? What's its new name? What's it called? On what host did it run on? We haven't even talked about the fact that this thing could scale to, uh, you know, who knows how many number of hosts that are running. Could be five, 10, 100. Where did it go when it respond itself? So the services keep track of all that. Yep, 
And to kind of give you a visual representation, we have a service here that is going to be referencing a deployment, and it's going to be um, those deployments, again, each of those pods have unique IP addresses, and this load balancer makes sure that traffic gets to those endpoints. But the service, uh, the load balancer is monitoring that, but what if one of these pods die again? Um, they're not going to come up with the exact same IP address, right? That endpoint changes. And as you can see here, it takes care of that for you automatically. So now you have a new pod up with a new IP address, but it's still getting load balanced perfectly, and there's no, like, you know, manual configuration that you have to do. So to talk about another one, we need to now, uh, you know, allow traffic inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so we have a service called ingresses. This is going to be uh, exposing your cluster to outside traffic via HTTP and HTTPS. Um, it gives an external reachable URL, which we can send our traffic to. So um, there's rules that we can define within the ingress, so we can show you on this next page what that looks like. Can you go back to the previous, two, the previous one more slide? There. Notice the bottom. What IP addresses are we looking at? 10 dot somethings, 10 dot 23s and 10 24s are, are the things you see. Yeah, they're not routable to anybody. In fact, when you build a Kubernetes cluster in your data center, it is a data center in and of itself inside of your data center. Nobody in your infrastructure can route into it. There are no routes into Kubernetes. We're abstracting all the networking away. So there's no way for you to get into it. So how am I gonna to get to the UI if I'm, if I'm building this, this fictional word processor called Word inside of this, how do I get to the interface to do something to it if I can't see it? We need this. We need services to define it, and then we need to have this ingress controller that we're talking about here and rules that say, oh, you want to get inside of this cluster and, do, and see something, point to it. Well, let me build an interface for you, and, we, and they called it an ingress. And that is exactly what this is. So as you can see here, we have a user that is going to have traffic going from two sections of this website. And this ingress is defining over here um, what pass that's going to. So slash foo, slash bar. And this is going to then take that ingress and say, there's two paths that we want to direct that traffic to. And we want to direct one path, the slash foo, to service A. And service A is going to load balance that and then send that to the pods you know, somewhere down here. And then the slash bar, same concept, but now it's going to service B. So again, abstracting away the, the network and just this demarcate, uh, this line is demarcating the uh, Kubernetes boundary. So this is all external traffic coming into the ingress and so forth. So let's just continue on. There's a lot of resources out there. Again, Kubernetes, everything is a resource. You have config maps, maps which st uh, store non-confidential data in a key value pair. We have secrets that are base64 encoded, um, you know, TSL certs, bootstrap tokens, et cetera. Persistence volumes, so um, storage in the cluster that has been provisioned by an admin. You can actually do that just manually, or you can do it dynamically through um, a storage class, such as Longhorn, which is a tool that we have at Rancher for that. Um, and then horizontal pod scalers, and that allows you to set, you know, via some metrics, like if pods are reaching a certain amount of CPU, it'll automatically scale out more pods, distribute the traffic, et cetera. So, uh, and then the last, oh, and cron jobs as well. So in case you just want something that runs once to completion. So to talk, talk about the architecture here, um, Again, so because this is all done via API calls, uh, it's speaking through the API, we're using kubectl, this uh, command line tool, to actually speak to the control plane. And as we can see here, the control plane houses things like the API server, uh, a scheduler which binds pods to nodes, the controller manager which, you know, takes care of running controllers for deployments, replication, uh, replication controllers, uh, services, uh, let's see, deployments, et, et cetera. Um, and then just off here at the left, we have the etcd. Again, it's storing in a key value pair. Um, so the etcd is leader-based distributed system um, and so forth. And oops, I wanted to go over here, not do that. And so on the right, for this right, we actually have, it doesn't say it, but they're defined as nodes here, but they're worker nodes. And this is actually where you end up deploying your, um, you know, workloads, not just the ones that are within Kubernetes, like the control plane, 
and so forth. Did and, you talk about CRDs at all? Uh, a little bit, yeah. Custom resource definitions. Yeah. I didn't mention them yet, but we will. But we will. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and the worker node has a kubelet. That kubelet is serving information to the uh, cube API server, notifying it like, hey, this is what's going on in the worker nodes. The, the, the etcd that you're seeing there, by the way, um, it knows about all the resources that are running in the work, uh, on the worker nodes and all the resources that exist in Kubernetes, and it knows everything. And it is, as, as he mentioned, as Austin mentioned, it's, a, it's a, a unique database that was built to do this. It was called a key value pair. It's real simple, very fast lookup. But it just stores a ton of information, and it is replicated when you have multiple control plane nodes. In our picture, we only have one. Our friend here has a question. Question. Yes, it is unclear to me. So each node, is that a, made up of a collection of services? Uh, but, uh, it's a node. Consider it a, that's a virtual machine or physical bare metal. That's a virtual machine, physical bare metal, virtual machine, physical or bare metal, virtual machine or, you know, or physical bare metal. Those are all individual real servers doing something. They have an operating system loaded on them, and then they run Kubernetes. So it's a really slim format, if you will, or, or it's a very slim layer. You have, a, you have a smallest operating system. I mean, I don't even need much from your operating system at all. I just want you to run. In fact, we have something called Slee Micro at SUSE that is this very small, hardly takes up any room, you know, you can put it in your back pocket, that kind of small. We don't need anything from the, the operating system itself. All that it runs is the container runtime that, that, that Kubernetes is. And on the node is where you put the pods, and inside the pods is where you put the deployments, which the, have the containers, right? Deployments yeah. are pods, and then pods have containers, which, okay. yes. Yeah. You, you were like right. And there. so you tell Kubernetes, you tell the, one of the control plane guys, Here's my deployment manifest that you saw earlier. And then it reads through that and says, okay, I know what you want me to do. I know how many copies of things you want. And then I'll go grab them all. And, and when he pointed to something called Nginx earlier, and he said, I want an image in a certain version, it, by default, we know where to go. There's these things called registries that everybody piles their, their images into. And then we can just pull from them. Was there a question in the far back? No, okay. Um, so yes. The YAML file defines the deployments, but it doesn't define the nodes. That's no. The Correct. So the YAML. So the question was: the YAML file or the statement defines the deployment, does not define the nodes themselves, and that is absolutely correct. Those are those are those are specific things that are built outside of when this deployment. Say, this one was hmm. Yes. And if you do things in the cloud, we can actually, like, through some tools we have, you can actually just automatically spin up more. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And we'll continue. So setting up Kubernetes takes a lot. There is a fun little project, Kubernetes the hard way on GitHub. Um, you can go through that and manually set up a Kubernetes cluster or, you know, essentially like distribution in a sense. Um, but just like Linux from, you don't usually compile Linux from scratch unless you're, like, a bit of a masochist. And, um, there are distributions out there. So uh, we at SUSE actually have, acqu we acquired Rancher back in 2020, and with that came a couple of things. Um, you know, some tools such as Rancher itself, and then also the Rancher Kubernetes Engine 2, or Rancher Gov. Um, this is a distribution of Kubernetes. It is going to be more security-based, so it meets those FIPS compliance, CIS benchmarks, and it uses Container D as a runtime. Um, Back in the day, Docker was actually the runtime, but that was deprecated and removed from the upstream Kubernetes world, and so now there's things like Container D and some, some other container runtimes out there. Um, but it's meeting that standard in the cloud native world, and then we also have um, kind of the, the princess in, in my mind is the <laughs> K3S. So K3S was developed as supposed to be like a lightweight, it's actually just a, you know, a visual joke, because K8s is the abbreviation for Kubernetes, slice that in half, and it's K3S. So it's extremely small. Uh, you can deploy it on edge, um, IoT, et cetera. Similar to um, RKE2 with container D, 
but this is also comes with MySQL Lite. Um, you can obviously use other, uh, so you can use Postgres, etcd, uh, MySQL, uh, et cetera, and it is, again, optimized for like ARM deployments as well. So, you know, K3S isn't a replacement, sorry, it's a distribution of Kubernetes. Yes, sorry, the, like there's, there's multiple out there, uh, GKE for, you know, Google, uh, RKE too, like I just said, uh, et cetera, and, you know, a lot of major companies. Just like there's different di Linux distributions. Yeah. There's SUSE, there's Red Hat, there's Ubuntu, yep. Rocky, Alma, there's a, there's a whole bunch of people that build a Kubernetes distribution mm -hmm. that builds the infrastructure that supports these containers as they run. Cool. And so, you know, like that previous picture where it's like, how do you manage a couple containers? Well, you start building environments in, uh, you know, production environments, and you start having clusters uh, where there's different teams, there's different products and different clusters. You need to be able to, you know, give access to certain people, and how do you end up managing that? And that's where Rancher Labs decided to create their tool. And so, you know, managing the Kubernetes ecosystem also ends up being really difficult because it's quite large. This is just, yeah, database. This is all just databases. So if you look at the cloud native landscape, it's massive. Um, you have everything from container runtimes, registries, uh, networking, service message, meshes, etc. cetera. Um, so, oops, we uh, went ahead and built out kind of something that we can bring up and have things going like day two operations pretty quick. So. With Kubernetes down here, we have, again, these are the distributions that we support. You know, anything that's in the cloud native, you can work with Rancher, you can work with us. Um, you can deploy on top of any of your Linux distributions, um, such as like RHEL, Ubuntu, Oracle, these ones right here. And then um, we deploy Rancher on top of a Kubernetes cluster. So with that comes tools that we manage and build for you. Uh, both with Prometheus, Grafana, Istio for service mesh. We have a Terraform operator, and then we obviously have our uh, Longhorn storage, which I mentioned earlier. So that's gonna be block storage that uh, is going to be built into your Kubernetes uh, cluster. So now I can, you know, be done with slides, and we can actually get into. And real quick, before we go, go back to the CNCF slide. So this, this notion of CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, <laughs> If you think about what, where all this originated when Google built this, it was for building out their cloud services. Think about every time you open up your browser and type in a search phrase. It spawns off a container that, that d performs your search, and then when you're done, phew, goes away. So, there, so, so containers are expected to exist for moments in time and not any longer. There, there could be some that are persistent. We talked about stateful sets, and, or at least we listed those earlier. They're, they're kind of an advanced idea, but the containers are running. This landscape, these are all the people that are currently building little projects that all contribute to this notion of a, of a cloud native world that run in this Kubernetes landscape that provide different kinds of things. And you saw the, the one screen he had just was databases, but I don't know, there's 200 or some here. And they all do a whole bunch of little things. So there is a huge momentum, support. You know, a lot of people are behind this effort. This is not some little fledgling thing, Kubernetes. It has got, it's got some momentum going. And these are all the players that are, that are playing in the space. And these are the, are the ones that we would say comply with the standards. As always, I can, I can build something and then everybody takes some of it and does, does their own thing. So the, the CNCF, so you look for things that are CNCF certified. All of these guys are expected to run in the same place, execute at the same time, live together nicely, defines the space for everybody to live in that, and work successfully. So you'll see cloud native or CNCF, you'll hear these kinds of things as we go. A lot of people doing a lot of good things here. Cool. And so, uh -huh. this is where I can run, uh, 
So yeah, yeah. So this is the distribution layer. Yeah, that's the distribution layer. That bottom layer is going to be your host operating system, so your OS layer. And then um, what happens on top of that is we actually deploy Rancher as a Helm chart. Um, it is just, and it also is going to then, oh, we'll, it'll be oh. a better visual representation. Yeah, we kind of we kind of skipped. But that we, will run on any of those distributions. Yep. Yeah. So this is the operating system layer. This represents those nodes we looked at. This is the Kubernetes layer. And notice some of the guys in the middle, those are things that you don't even have to build. They just exist in the cloud providers, and you can just go pay to use their services. You don't have to build any of the, of the lower stuff. And what's interesting is this stuff up here that Austin was talking about. We, remember we, earlier we talked about a single word EXE turned into a whole bunch of microservices, and now there's 30 of them? We've got to manage that. Well, what happens when you have... So, and so you build a Kubernetes cluster to manage that. What happens when you have 50 Kubernetes clusters? I got to manage that, right? It just keeps going up and up and up. And so this layer here is where we get into, well, what happens when I've got more than one Kubernetes layer? What if I've got this guy running and a bunch of those running and this running over here and all of a sudden I've got 50? Give me an interface. Show me where I can see them all. Help me to deploy them. Help me to delete them when I want them to go away. Give me some, uh, <laughs> some ability here because you're killing me with all these Kubernetes clusters you keep launching. And so that's what, that's what we do with this layer. Yep. And now we can do the, I'm going to give you guys some time to, can you guys see the instructions up here? So this is going to be um, Hobby Farm, and this is where we're going to have some instances up and running for you guys now. So if you go to learn.na, Maybe I can zoom in and that will make things better. I can't. That was foolhardy. Um, so yeah, learn.na.hobbyfarm.io. Uh, and what we're going to do is then you register with an email and a password. And then you enter in this access code. Oops. You enter this access code over here. So you probably need to refresh your browser. But I'll give you guys some time to do that. Maybe walk around and see if anyone needs help. But um, sorry that this, maybe, yeah, let's see if I can. Learn.na.hobbyfarm.io. Um, if you ever want to do another rodeo, yes. If you don't, then no. Uh, I will say if, you know, I don't know if any of you have done a rodeo before. We don't have a way to retrieve passwords. So um, yeah, if you want to end up doing a Rodeo, we offer Rodeos for other products as well. Definitely memorize the password for that or put it into a, your password manager. You're going to register at learn.na.hobbyfarm.io. So OK, OK, yeah. I'm going to swap my screen real quick. Um, so I want to make sure that everyone went over into, so if you're in the Hobby Farm landing page, in the top right, you should have your email address listed there. Click on that, and then go down to Manage Access Codes. And there, you will enter this access code, which is scale lowercase 2024. And then you should see um, a scenario pop up. And so I will show you what that looks like. Let me just, you know change some things real quick after did you enter that access code when you registered yes okay perfect just making sure because sometimes that doesn't get clear I'm gonna change some settings Let's see if I can 
can get this to mirror. While Austin switches over, let me just throw something out to you. We talked about these things called Kubernetes resources, deployment, stateful sets, services, ingress controllers, ingresses, the um, services, there's a whole bunch of things. These are called objects, these are resources. The, the beauty that they built into this idea of Kubernetes is, well, what happens if we wanna come up with a new object later? What if we wanna build a new one? So, so I, asked, I was asking earlier, about CRDs, these custom resource definitions. So you saw the manifest file that we saw earlier that was just the deployment where we kind of declared what the deployment was gonna be. Well now, I can just throw at this, at this cluster, guess what, I want a brand new object to be created, here is its definition, I want everybody to know what it is so that when I start making calls to it and I start asking for things and I start passing information and I reference it, I want everybody to know what this is. So, we had, so they came up with this idea of a CRD. So this thing is ever expanding. It can have all kinds of things. If you make up in your mind something that you see is missing, go create a CRD, build a whole thing around it, publish it, and then everybody can use it. It will not break anything. So it's meant to be extensible. Cool, so everyone should see this. If you don't, then there are some steps that we're gonna have to take. Um, so the question is, does anyone not see it? Yeah, does any, I think you don't, do you not see it? Okay, can you go help yep. him, maybe show him the, yep. so one thing, you might have to refresh your page. Again, if, um, if you can use either Mozilla Firefox or a Chrome-based web browser, but you can manage the access codes here. And then under, uh, so today's access code is scale 2024. So if we all click start scenario, we're requesting our virtual machine resources. We have these pre-running. Um, so if you guys wanted to just make sure you're on this page and then we can begin scenario. Uh, give you a second to go away from this page onto the next. So, I'll make sure we can get everyone caught up here. Does anyone have any other questions real quick? Or um, just to give an outline, the agenda, what we're gonna be doing here is, again, provisioning a cluster. We're gonna be doing that with uh, our distribution, RK2. Then we put Rancher on top of that. And then once we have Rancher running, we provision more clusters, well, another cluster using Rancher. So. Um, yeah. Perfect. Um, and again, this should be, every, you guys should be seeing the exact same thing as me. Uh, we have an info tab, a cluster zero one tab, and then a rancher zero one tab. Um, what's going to happen is, let's see, okay, that's good. Um, what's going to happen is as we go along these instructions, we're just gonna click on some commands and it's going to start doing the installation on um, the appropriate uh, VM, but there are some situations, and I'll, I'll address it in the future, but there are some situations where we actually manually need to paste something into the terminal. Please make sure that you take pause there and like let me instruct you through it, because if we run a couple commands in the wrong spots, it will have an issue. So um, let's go next. So again, this is not an, uh, a highly available installation. This is a single node. And so what the first thing we're gonna do here is actually using a curl command, we're gonna click on this right here, we're, you know, and we'll see if we click on the rancher tab over here, um, there's going to be a pseudo command that we can click on and that's going to run an installation script that we have for RKE2. Again, this is a Kubernetes distribution. From there, we need to do some uh, configuration. So we click on the rancher01 tab, correct? Yep, uh, just to see it, yes. It will automatically run inside of your Rancher 01 when you're clicking these. But this is the command that's being ran. If you click on it, and as you can see here, we've got everything situated. So, now we need to configure the RK2 cluster. 
So we're gonna make a directory in Etsy slash rancher slash RKA2. We're gonna make a, a cube config and uh, define what its uh, permissions are and yep, perfect. And then if we want, you know, sudo systemctl enable and start and this is actually starting that RKE2 cluster. Um, just give that a second. You guys will notice like down here it's just paused for a brief moment. And is anyone? So, yeah, so the first command installed Kubernetes on your whatever node that is, the Rancher 01 node. That's all it took to build a Kubernetes server. Now that's one, and we're going to be, we're having, we are building a Kubernetes server that's doing all three roles. It's an etcd server, so it's running the database. It's a control plane, so it's monitoring everything. And it's a worker node, so it's doing all three roles. If you were to build this out in a 25 node cluster, you could say, I want three etcd nodes, and I want five control plane nodes, and I want everybody else to be a worker node. You can. You can break it up that way, but today we have just got one, it's doing everything. So that first command created a, a, a Kubernetes distribution or Kubernetes server using our distribution, that's all it took. Yep. One simple command and you were up and running. You can access the logs here and see what that actually looks like. Um, it has some wait time and that's, that's fine, it just takes a second to, to catch up, but it is up and running. So we're gonna go ahead and go next here, so if everyone clicks on next, Make sure you're at the top. You're gonna. The, the thing, do we need to do that? Uh, I did it. I know it's just this. It's just this log right here. If you look up, it, it's, it's just saying that it's starting the Kubernetes. It Ranch tells you if it's running. So it's yep. sort of like a troubleshooting test. Yep. Just validating along the way that we're working. Yep. And so now uh, we actually need to install the kubectl, which is going to be the command line tool that we use to monitor Kubernetes clusters at the terminal level. So if we run this curl command, um, it will do all of that for us. And let's, oh crap, okay, now I actually need to get out of the. That's fair. Okay, so if you ran the journal command, make sure that you get out of it, because I didn't. Now let's run that command and Boom, we've got kubectl, we have it uh, in user.local.bin, slash bin, et cetera. And um, so to ensure that kubectl can connect for Kubernetes clusters, you actually have to reference that kube config, which we uh, referenced in the previous step in the etc slash rancher slash config um, and so forth. Yeah, but so now, one of the keys to the kingdom here is that config file. So when you installed your Kubernetes cluster, that process creates a file, and the file could be under a couple different names, and it doesn't matter what it's called, but its content is very important. That content is how you're going to talk to that Kubernetes cluster, because that Kubernetes cluster has a, has a um, SSL certificate that is required. It is generated by the Kubernetes build process, Kubernetes itself creates this Kubernetes certificate, uses it for all communication. So everything that communicates inside the cluster is uh, uh, over SSL via the certificate. So we need this guy or we cannot talk to that cluster. We don't know how to talk to it. We don't have the certificate to do so. Yep. So this config file for us we initially put it under slash Etsy Rancher RKE2, RKE2.yaml. But Kubernetes expects that file to be called config, C-O-N-F-I-G. And if you put that file in your home directory under the dot kube directory, which is what one of these steps will do for you, this kubectl command knows by default whoever's running kubectl Go look under the .kube directory in their home directory, find the config file there, use that to connect to the cluster so that you can look at it and query it and do things. Exactly. So now that um, we have that config, we're going to reference it to that uh, dot .kube uh, directory. And so then we should have the ability to run kubectl commands because kubectl can see the Kubernetes cluster's configuration. So let's run kubectl get nodes and we will have 
the name of the node, it's going to be the internal IP address, it's going to have those roles like Brian uh, referenced earlier, again, all three, so we've got control plane, etcd, master, uh, and then it shows the version. Yeah, so, so this is important because we can't, we won't be able to go on further if we don't have this working. Is this not working for anybody? Does anybody not have the kubectl returning? Is it giving you like a local host, 88? Ah, so if you need to install kubectl, there's this command, the curl, um, and it should give you this nice little, uh, you know, representation of how much it's been installed. It's a curl command that references the um, documentation for kubectl. So, yeah, so to do that one. So your cluster's probably working, but we don't have the tool that queries it. So, so get that, follow, kind of follow from the steps and see where you go. Yeah, you something over here? Permission denied. Interesting. So that tells me that you're not, you're, you're not pointing to the right kube config file. So I would go back and validate the previous step that you clicked on that made the .kube directory and that did the link, that, did, that created the soft link for it. Make sure that happened. When you do a connection refuse, is that when you ran the kubectl command? Uh, yeah, or the if, if, if you can't find the config file, it'll give you all uh, kinds of grief. Yeah, sure Make sure that you ran the, 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 the ln minus l or s. What do we do? Did we do a soft link? Yeah, we did so a soft link. I went ahead and typed, it, typed in this command here at the top. If anyone's having issues, we just got to, let's make sure that we have the RK2 service running. So the engine here, V2, uh, should be active. If you do systemctl status RKE2 server, uh, and you would just type that in there. So, you know, just some brief troubleshooting. All right, I'm gonna get out of this right here and I'll have Brian hop around and help any of those who need to spend some time just getting caught up a little. So uh, again, just to kind of backtrack a little, we're gonna run kubectl, get nodes. Those are those hosts. This is the VM. This is the thing that has a, a Linux distribution on it. And then we are going to ne then run kubectl, get pods. So if we run uh, kubectl, get pods, tack, tack, all namespaces, you can actually see all of the pods, therefore containers, that get deployed with our distribution, RKE2. So if you ran kubectl get pods, you'll see things such as, um, again, I mentioned the controller manager, uh, I mentioned the kube API server. These are all, this is cut off, but it's, these are all one for one out of the status and running or there'll be zero one, which these were essentially a job that needed to run to what completion. And so we've installed some things here, uh, Canal uh, as the CNI, Core DNS, um, Ingress Nginx, uh, and a metric server. Those are all things that come with our RKE2 distribution um, and so forth. So, you know, again, to reference the uh, actual pod that's running Canal, uh, it's right here with RKA2 Canal, same thing with DNS and Ingress uh, controllers, so yeah. Yes, all of those are running as pods within the cluster, but this is, these are the, these are the working pieces of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that's why they are in the namespace cube system. Uh, we will see some other namespaces here momentarily once we start installing other um, applications into our Kubernetes cluster. So if we click next, everyone should be on the page where it says install Helm. Helm is a package manager, um, and what it's going to do is allow you to deploy these YAML files as Helm charts. So just to specify, you saw those YAML files uh, with like the services, the 
deployments, et cetera, a Helm chart is essentially a lot of those. Um, and then they are just referenced into a file and you can deploy that Helm uh, chart via that. So first thing we need to do is curl that, make sure that we've got it running, or not got it running, but got Helm versioned in there. So if we do Helm version, so I clicked on this curl command. I'm now gonna click on Helm version, dash dash client. It looks like we're good, we've got the right version. And then we can use Helm and list all the namespaces that it may have uh, for Helm charts. So as you can see here, uh, RK2 was actually a Helm chart versioned for these uh, services that we provide with that canal, core DNS, and metric server. Like architecture or a version? Well, Helm, Helm is, so Helm was listed on that cloud native. Um, so the question is, is like Helm essentially like but something? Part of yeah, it's, it's not necessarily part of Rancher. We do utilize it because it's a grad, it's a, it's, a, it's a package manager that allows you to deploy applications inside of um, CNCF certified clusters. So it is just, it's just a tool that is basically become a, like pretty standard because it's a graduated project. It's like, it's got a lot of funding. It's maintained by a lot of people. Um, so let me continue. Great question. So now um, there's some requirements that Rancher needs now. In Rancher, we're gonna have to have our TLS, TLS certs self-signed and so we're gonna install a cert manager. Um, so we're gonna do that from Jetstack and you can just do this with that, that you know, a Helm command, and we do Helm repo add, and then it says Jetstack has been added to your repositories. And so there's going to be a Helm chart in there, um, and when you do Helm install, it's gonna reference that Helm chart, and you can actually uh, use some variables to set, um, you know, versions, you can set the namespace that it gets installed into, uh, and you can define if it has, doesn't have that namespace created, you can actually do that, so we're gonna, just gonna list this out, and he briefly, Brian had mentioned CRDs, that is custom resource definition files. So that would, that would basically be an application that's outside of the typical like Kubernetes deployment um, custom resources. So we're just gonna click on Helm install. Yeah, can just, I'll pause here as everyone, all nice and caught up. We're just currently installing, perfect, awesome guys. Um, now we'll just wait for this to start working and we can actually check the rollout status of our cert manager. Um, so it looks like, looks like everything's good here, but I'm just gonna use a key. Yep, yep. And this is, again, this is good, just gonna reference the Helm install is referencing cert manager inside of Jetstack. Well, it's referencing the name. And then inside of that repo, that Jetstack repo, there's cert manager uh, Helm chart and then you're giving it the namespace version and you're creating the namespace if it hasn't already been created, which it hasn't. So um, if we check the status of the rollout, we can just click kubectl uh, slash n cert manager rollout status and it says cert manager successfully rolled out. Super sick, awesome. Now, um, Does everybody know what Helm does? Did you describe what Helm is? Yeah, it's a, a yeah, a reference. Okay. Like it's a package manager and the next thing that we do here is we're actually gonna start, um, we can also check the status of, I believe, the webhook. Um, yep, that's successfully ro rolled out. So we're good to go. We've got the cert manager webhook and uh, cert manager deployment all taken care of. So let's click next, because the segue that I wanted to go into is Rancher is a Helm chart, essentially, just like most applications for Kubernetes clusters. Um, we deploy it as a Helm chart. So when we do Helm repo add, we're actually going to add the Helm repo that we have for Rancher. So if we click this here, we're now on the install Rancher step. We should be about like 25% of the way through the um, lab or the practice, whatever you wanna call this. And then um, we clicked on Helm repo add and it should say Rancher dash latest has been added to your repositories. And then from there, we're gonna go ahead and install Rancher. Um, what this installation does is to have it have a host name, we're actually gonna use um, slip.io to have it some like a DNS that we can reference. Um, and then uh, 
from here we're going to set it to a version 2.73 and we're going to create a namespace like we did with cert manager. So if we click on that, this will take a second and it's going to say happy containering right there. Um, so we're going to go, everyone should have ran that helm install rancher command and we're just going to go next. Oh, uh, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention or did you mention about the importance of DNS? No. Kubernetes loves DNS. Why? Because there are so many IP addresses. Mm -hmm. Every one of us has an IP address. You, you, you know, there's just, and guess, you know, we're using that 10 dotted number. So we're using a, a, an IP number scheme that can go up into the bazillions. So how do we manage things? We cannot manage it by IP. We've got to know names. So DNS is important. One of the resources you'll see is a core DNS pod will be deployed into your Kubernetes cluster to help manage all of the DNS names that will be created for every one of the resources that shows up in this Kubernetes cluster. Hobby Farm can get very overloaded with, with uh, cause it's up in AWS, so it's with everybody doing something. Is someone having an issue with their Hobby Farm instance? Is it, is it slow or is it just working? Uh, within the terminal or like the actual Huh, Do give it a, like a, uh, are you on Windows? What's like the f cache, like recache the website, refresh for Windows? Like if you're on Mac, it's command shift R, huh? I don't, can't remember, I've been, it's been so long since I've used Windows. Control shift R? Okay, yeah, that would make sense. Command shift R is for Mac, so. Um, all right, so if you're on this page with me, verify rancher is ready to access. We ran a while true command and it's going to be basically checking whether or not this um, HTTPS, the website is actually available. Uh, it did that for a brief amount of time and then said it wasn't ready, but now it says rancher is ready. Um, so I will go on to this next page. Again, raise your hand if you're having some, you know, need to get caught up and Brian can come over to you and kind of assist. So. So now we're in the page where it says accessing Rancher. Um, so to note, what we're gonna start doing some uh, manual command pasting to get some uh, a bootstrapped password. So first thing that we're gonna do is um, go to this page here. If you just click on it, it should op automatically open. The connection is not private, we're just using self-signed certs. So what you're gonna have to do is go to advanced um, and click on proceed to Rancher your guys' IP address, .slip.io, uh, and if you do that, you should be good. You can also, if you don't have the proceed to rancher button, this is unsafe. Uh, if you just type that into the web page, you can actually get past this uh, connection is not private. I had a question back here, Austin. The SSL IPIO, that is only what we're doing in Hobby Farm. You will not see this in your own labs. You'll never use this for yourself. This is just for us to provide DNS inside of Hobby Farm. So exactly. it's just a thing there. Don't, don't remember SSL IPIO. Don't remember that. Does not matter? Yep. It's just in this lab. Yep. But you need to see this. This should work. Yes. So now this is where you need to actually get that uh, bootstrapped password. So as you can see here, it says for a Helm installation, you need to run kubectl get secret. And it's just going to decode the bootstrap password because it's just base64 base encoded. Um, and you're going to copy this. So if you click on that, kubectl secret command, um, and then you actually come back into your terminal, you paste it, and then run it. It'll actually spit out your guys' bootstrap password. Um, so then you copy that, and again, this is in the Rancher 01. I wanna make sure that everyone's got the Rancher 01 um, tab selected uh, as of right now. And then you take that bootstrap password, you know, we can verify some things here, BVG, um, BVG, and then CWV at the end for me. I guess you guys don't need to hear me saying that. Um, and you log in with local user. There is a way when you, before you install Rancher that you can specify your own bootstrap password. We didn't, so it generated its own, but we talked about how things are declarative. One of the things we can do when we install Rancher is we can use a declarative file to tell it, here's what I want your bootstrap password to be. Here are some other values that I want you to know about. Go, 
and then it will, it will use your own password versus something like that. Cool, and so here well, I'm just making my own password real quick where the server URL should automatically populate for you guys using that slip.io. Uh, make sure you check this. By checking this box, you accept the end user license agreements, the T's and C's, and click continue. So we're logging in as the admin here, and then we're going to end up on the Rancher landing page. The lose, yes, yes, it is admin. So if you, if you, for whatever reason, needed to close down the browser and bring it back up and go to your slip.io for Rancher um, URL, you would log in with admin. And you can actually see that up here in the top right. Uh, there's gonna be a little, you know, creature and admin. So, <coughs> sorry. Um, this, we've got Rancher deployed. So just to reference this, this page is the dashboard. I'm gonna try and command it. That, perfect. This is the local cluster. So like I said, Rancher is deployed into a Kubernetes cluster, um, and then it is going to manage other clusters from that said cluster. Uh, I have seen this with a few customer calls. The local cluster is not for workloads. Don't, you'll mess up a whole bunch of stuff. So this is just for Rancher. Um, we obviously have some tools that you can deploy in there, like Prometheus and Grafana, to like have observability of your local cluster, as well as like a backup um, tool, so you can back up your actual rancher deployment. Um, but this is not where you put workloads. But it is good to note because then you can see things like you know how many pods are deployed. You can see how much CPU and memory that this node has. Um, you can see the version here and so forth. So everyone should see this, everyone should have it up and running. And I'm going to, oh. So the local yes, the local cluster, yeah, perfect, great. I just, yeah, thank you, yeah. So the local cluster is the uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster where Rancher lives. So 110 is essentially like the base limit that we put for pods to be a, in a singular node. Uh, you can change that and adjust that, but that's saying that there's just 28 of 110 pods deployed. So do you remember when we did kubectl git um, pods? If we did that again over here, it would have a larger list. So I can you know, go off script here real quick. If you guys wanna either um, you know, go up on the arrow keys and do kubectl git pods, oh, I should've just typed it out, but um, kubectl git pods, all namespaces, you can still do things within this Kubernetes cluster um, from this terminal. And you'll see cube system, but now you'll see things like cattle system namespace, which has our rancher webhook. You can see the cert manager that we deployed, um, et cetera. And I can actually show you what that looks like further. So what we'll do is go to this next. We're in Hobby Farm right now, and we are going to go to the step that says creating a Kubernetes lab cluster within rancher. So I'll show you how you can actually run the terminal within Rancher for your Kubernetes cluster and um, other places within Kubernetes, within Rancher, and therefore your Kubernetes clusters. So let's go ahead and what we'll do is navigate back to your web browser that you have Rancher's uh, web page, and we're gonna go to click on this create button. Um, if you're not on this page, just go to the hamburger menu, click on home, um, and come and click on this create. So this is saying we're gonna create a downstream cluster. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an, another RKE2 cluster that we can actually put workloads on. Um, and for this example, this demo, it's going to be a WordPress deployment. So just to show you guys kind of like to walk through this, if you deployed this um, cluster in the same manner at home, and you guys you know, have access to Azure, um, AWS, or GCP, you can actually use your guys' uh, secrets and access keys to essentially deploy more uh, clusters downstream, but they'll live in those clouds. Um, yeah, if you, if you go, you, there'd be some networking hurdles, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, the give you then if you wanted this you'd be able to deploy sorry 
this first page or this top section is actually going to be deploying uh, different genres of Kubernetes distributions. So AKS, EKS. Um, this section right here actually deploys our version of Kubernetes, so our distribution. Uh, see here we have it toggled as RKE2 or K3S. Um, we also have a version called RKE1. It's, it's got a Docker shim as the runtime, so we don't really, we really just recommend stay up to date because the RKE1, we still like, you know, from a support standpoint, yeah, people are using it to this day, but we prefer people to use RKE2 because it kind of fits more of that Kubernetes standard. But anyway, you would deploy EC2 instances or you could use Linode, VMware, DigitalOcean. There's actually even other drivers um, that you could uh, come here and look at. So there's cluster drivers. These are not necessarily like out of the box ready to go. You, there could be some configuration, but there's, these are some other Kubernetes distributions, so cluster drivers. Um, and then there's also different node drivers where it would deploy with uh, RKE2. And so you can actually look at all these. So you've got like Nutanix in there, OpenStack, et cetera. Um, but let's get back to, I'm gonna have to go back to the uh, home page and click on that create button again. So where we're deploying is we're gonna scroll down to the bottom, make sure that, oh, why is this not scrolling? There it is. Make sure that the RKE2 is toggled and then we're gonna click on custom. So this is gonna say we're essentially gonna deploy onto a bare metal node. Um, in this inst instance, it's a virtual machine, but uh, yeah. So we're gonna click create and we're gonna change some things. Let's make sure that we're following along with the steps. So we went to the Rancher homepage, we clicked create, then we scrolled down to the custom cluster on existing nodes. Um, in this section, we're gonna have some things that we need to reference. We need to give it a cluster name, and then we're also, for later purposes, we're gonna give it an older versioning. So let's go back to our Rancher deployment. Let's take this um, and give it a name. Let's see, um, RK, so Rodeo, uh, let's do scale. Uh, you can name it whatever you want. Uh, do use lowercase, please. Otherwise, you will have an error. Um, and then come into this drop-down menu and you can actually select uh, the 1.23 version of RKE2. And then we're gonna leave everything else um, as default. So just like with the RKE2 cluster that we ran that curl command and we did like kubectl get pods, we noticed that the services, core DNS, nginx, metric server, those were all deployed with the, the curl command. But here we can actually start doing things like adding member roles. So if we wanted to do some role-based access controlling here, we could add a member to this cluster and you know give them read-only access. So the, the end user is somebody that doesn't get to actually deploy anything, but they, you know, they have access to some like internal documentation or something like that. Um, and so forth. But I'm gonna go back to this basic cluster configuration portion right here, scroll down to the bottom, as long as we have the name and the Kubernetes version as 1.23, and we click create. And when we click create, we now have a registration command, um, and then we have some other steps. So if we go to the hobby farm, we've accomplished um, steps up to six, or sorry, up to seven, and now we're on step eight and nine and et cetera. Um, so what we need to do is look at that registration command. We're going to check out what roles we're defining for this um, downstream cluster, and then we're gonna click on show advanced. So we're gonna look at the roles. We have etcd selected, control plane, worker, and then we also have the um, command itself. First and foremost, we're gonna click on show advanced, and we're gonna come over here, and we're gonna copy and paste from our hobby farm tab our private and public IP addresses. So this is where we gotta do some, uh, make sure that we're using the right tabs and et, et cetera. So to be clear, make sure that you have this rancher tab selected. Make sure that you go to the private IP right here, do a little um, copying, come back to rancher, go to the private, 1.7, yep, there it is. And then if you come to the, ho the public IP, copy that. Boom. And we now have, um, 
host name, you can just leave that blank and it will just automatically name it. Um, you could just give it something uh, if you wanted for your own case, but I would just, I just leave it blank and we'll, it'll automatically assign a name to it. Okay, the the clusters IP, ranchers IP. So it's the so again because all this is done through HTTPS, we're actually referencing the um, that is actually the ranchers DNS, right? So that's that slip.io. So in this registration command, it's talking up to our rancher deployment um, in order to have the downstream cluster basically get observed and yeah. Does that make sense? Because it's not. It's not just the IP address that's being referenced in the command. It is the, um, it should have your, uh, oh. You know what? I am super silly. Holy cow. Thank you. Thank you. I messed up. See, this is what I'm talking about. I need to talk this through better. Holy cow. We're not referencing Rancher. Please do not paste anything yet. So come back to this cluster 01. What's your name in the red? You deserve, I'm, you deserve something. Max? Thank you, Max. So actually come to this public IP of cluster 01 and we're going to replace those things that we just previously did. So we're going to change those to the cluster 01 private and public IP addresses. They shouldn't be. So in the node public, use the node private for, um, yes, you could just use the instructions. So this is, this is the cluster 01's public IP address, and this is cluster uh, 01's uh, private. If you notice here, I have this tab selected, and I had previously selected Rancher 01 on accident and started copying big mistakes. But if you actually followed the instructions, you would have been able to just copy these into those fields. Um, see how it says very important? Thank you, thank you so much, Max, that was so great. Um, so then we need to come back here, make sure that we've got the right IP. Just for um, sanity check, you can look and make sure that this node public IP is not the same as your rancher deployment's IP. And then if we scroll to the bottom, we actually need to skip, um, we need to skip uh, the TLS verification because we just have self-signed. So make sure you have this highlighted. Now we have a registration command with the appropriate um, IP addresses. Whew. Um, cool. So let's just not paste yet and we're going to go to the next step. So let's just briefly look at this and say start the uh, Rancher Kubernetes cluster bootstrapping process. So we need to make sure we have selected 01 in Hobby Farm, cluster 01, and then um, we will run the command that we got from our Rancher deployment. So come here, click that, it says copied, you should be good to go. Then we run this command. I've pasted it in there, just click um, enter, double checked and made sure that I had cluster 01. And then if we wanna just get some provisioning steps, you can actually navigate to this, uh, to the rancher page and you see here you got some bootstrapping information and you can actually click on the provisioning logs. Um, this will be saying updating. You can actually look at the machine pools. So it automatically gave a node name uh, as this, as you know, because we didn't name it ourselves. So it's got custom. Uh, it has the OS as Linux right here. It has all the roles because we defined it as all the roles in the registration command. Um, you can look at the conditions. You can see that there is no cluster agent deployed. So that cluster agent is what's talking up to Rancher. Um, so that is a, a distinction I like to make because it allows for us to operate in an air-gapped environment. Um, the Rancher cluster is actually not going around and digging up. The downstream clusters are sending information up to the Rancher cluster. So that's something to note for air-gapped environments. Um, let's go back to the provisioning logs and just wait this out. It should take about like five minutes and we should have another uh, cluster up and running. Uh, again, this is the downstream cluster. So. This one, yeah, so for the, the downstream cluster, um, you know, yeah, it's just a singular node. 
like test environment. But if you wanted like highly available, the minimums, you know, three, yeah. So, um, question in the back. Uh, you can deploy it. Uh, yeah, you. Yeah, best practices would be to deploy it into uh, a Kubernetes cluster. You could use Docker. Uh, instead of the way that we did, but that's like a deprecated method. Um, but those are really the two deployment methods, yeah. Yes, you would use the rancher management cluster first before making any downstream clusters. But to note, that's a great question because I can actually show you um, some information here. I'm gonna let this just run, but if I come to cluster management, I can actually import existing clusters, and um, you could do, again, clusters if you already have them in your cloud providers, you would just go there, enter in the, um, you may basically make your, yeah, here, so your project ID, the cloud credentials, and then it would have a list, or you could, um, let's go back, or you could do, uh, so for instance, if you made a vanilla cluster with kubeadm, you could just type this out, um, kubeadm, you would click create, and it will give you a command to import uh, existing Kubernetes clusters for Rancher to then manage. So you could do that, but um, if you wanted, like, I think the one thing about um, imported clusters is they don't do certificate rotation automatically, so you'd have to do that yourself, but if you provision it through Rancher, whether it's in the cloud, um, or if you wanted to do it via, like, the bare metals, you, the uh, cert rotation is a lot more accessible. So I'm gonna go back here and go to cluster management. Uh, I'm going to go into the scale, I named it scale rodeo, and I'm gonna check on those provisioning log logs. Um, should just take a little bit. Is anyone having any issues? Is everyone pretty much waiting for this to update? Yours is done? Yours was quicker than mine? Yep. When it's in machines, yep, mine just finished as well as I was saying that. So it took, you know, as we could see, uh, we now have two clusters running. It took about, you know, eight minutes to get the second one going just from like reg sending the command down. And you can look at things like the machines. Uh, you can see what IP address, both external and internal, those are the ones we provided. You can go through the conditions and make sure everything's up. So it looks like the cluster agent, yep, that is no longer there, obviously. The deploy, it deployed one minute ago, and yeah, there's just some more information here, related resources, uh, and so forth. So if we go back to Hobby Farm. Great question. So the question is, would we use the same command for every node? That depends on how you wanna set it up. So if you wanted one with all roles, then yes, but that's usually not the case, right? Like, so you would end up selecting, deselecting, depending on what your needs are. So, you know, for instance, if somebody has, uh, their workloads take a lot more CPU, they need more worker nodes. So they would then add worker nodes via the, this command, and then you'll see in here, there is tac tac worker, and if we were to remove that, um, control plane, etcd, etc. So. Um, I mean, the big thing is that there's, it's resource constraints, right? Well, yeah, well, because it's going, it's going to deploy essentially those same, like, um, cube system pods into those pods as, into those nodes as well. So, yeah, and especially, like, once you start doing things with, like, edge deployments, you, that's where that can become quite important, right? So like if you have a worker node that you want to manage but you don't want it to have the, the data store and you don't want it to have all of the control plane tools in it, you just want it to be a worker node on like a Pi, then yeah, so. so this, what this did is it took, uh, since we did a custom deployment, uh -huh. created a virtual machine, which is the node that we installed from. It, it didn't, so because it's a custom deployment, it didn't create a virtual machine. It was a virtual machine that we had already set up. That's why in Hobby Farm, if you go here, um, there's two tabs. 
So it was as if we had like a, a think of like a bare metal. So if you had like a Raspberry Pi at home or a Nook or something like that already set up with an OS ready to go. That's what happened. If how do I register those? Let's say I've got five Pi's. Uh-huh. And I want them all to be used as nodes. Uh-huh. How do I do that? Well then in that case, um, you would just run this curls command on each of those Pi's. And then that would have the individual Pi's register with Yep, and it would become one cohesive cluster. Yep. Exactly. Um, perfect. Great questions, guys. So, uh, oh yeah, and if you wanted to use a Windows machine, you could, but you know. Uh, anyway, so uh, as you can see here, we went through the machine pools, we went through the conditions, we made sure that everything changed to active. Um, so just for some clarity real quick, I'm gonna go to the machines. We've got it running, we have it active. Everyone else should be in that state as well. So I'm gonna click on next. Um, and yeah, so we can actually start interacting with our Kubernetes cluster, the downstream cluster. We've already been interacting with uh, the local cluster, which is obviously the Kubernetes cluster. So if you come into cluster management and you want to look at the things that are deployed on your Kubernetes cluster, uh, you can go to explore. And this will give us some cool uh, information immediately. So this is the cluster dashboard. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can, there's a few ways to do this. If you go to the hamburger menu, um, there's gonna be, these are the global, like a global, global apps, but also, and under those global apps, there's cluster management, or they have the uh, explore cluster uh, tools built in. If you click on your cluster that's not the local one, just click it right there, or go to cluster management, and then go to explore, and we should be on the cluster dashboard. The downstream one, so not the local cluster. Um, whatever you named, yep, the custom cluster, correct. The, the local is the one running the cluster, yes. yes, yes. And so, um, you know, we're gonna leave that cluster alone. We're not gonna deploy anything else on the rancher cluster. Uh, we're gonna be pretty much operating solely now in this, uh, what we would call downstream cluster that is a custom cluster. So, I'd like to show you some things right off the bat. You can see the provider that we use, so RKA2. Um, if it was like a K3S, it would say K3S right there. Uh, it gives you the total amount of nodes. We have one node, we have 10 deployments, uh, 410 resources. It gives you some information about CPU, the memory, um, and then the total amount of pods. But the, the cool thing that I like on this page is you can actually go into the kubectl shell if you click this and um, depending on who you're signed in as, you can actually start running commands. So if you tap on that real quick, you'll see that we have, um, in the top right, you basically have a profile photo. Um, this is the default admin, and so if I am signed in as an admin and I click on this kubectl shell, it's just a greater, greater than sign, you know, yeah, anyway. Um, it will bring up a shell and you can start running commands as the admin of the cluster. So kubectl get all or get pods dash uh, capital A and you can come in here and you have another way to interact with the cluster. So previously we did that on the terminals and we were able to see all of our pods but we can see now what we've deployed with um, RKE2. So we can see that in the cube system we have those same things that we've already seen before. We have the Helm operator, or we have the, in the cattle system, we have um, our Helm operator, our fleet agent, um, et cetera. And so that's where the rancher webhook exists to speak to the upstream, uh, or the local cluster right there. So, yeah, pretty cool. You can also download that cube config, and if you have kubectl installed on your own terminal, you can actually um, take that config make it into a file on your local terminal, export it, and then you can just start running commands and easily, easily switch between like different clusters from your own terminal as long as you download the cube config for each of those. So pretty cool. You can also just copy it if you wanted. Um, so yeah, that's just some quick ways to interact with your cluster. And so we did the kubectl commands. Uh, I showed you, off the, showed you all the kube config file. 
And now we're going to start deploying applications. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually enable monitoring with Prometheus and Grafana. So if you come into your Rancher deployment, you will have this hamburger menu. Um, make sure that you've selected your downstream cluster. And if you have, you then should see cluster. Uh, you should see workloads. And you should see apps and then some stuff below it. If we select apps, we're actually going to go into the charts page. So we're selecting charts. And the really cool thing, we had um, a slide that represented all of this. The things that come built in with Rancher, the things that we you know, manage ourselves over at SUSE, we've got the CIS benchmarks. We have Istio, Longhorn. Uh, we have New Vector, which is a really cool container runtime tool uh, that in, is basically principled behind some zero trust principles. So it's like, you know, if it doesn't recognize the programs being ran in your containers, it just doesn't let them run processes. So pretty cool. But as you can see here, these are the applications that come with uh, Rancher, all in blue. If we go lower, these are our partner charts. And these contents, these contain Helm charts. Just like we previously deployed Helm charts with uh, the command line, we can now do that within the app's catalog. So we're going to click on monitoring, like this says here. So enable Rancher monitoring. To deploy Rancher monitoring, go to apps. We're there under charts. Locate monitoring. We did that. And then we should be on the install button, uh, or we should select the install button. So. This gives you some information, gives you some versioning, um, and so forth. Uh, so you've got a nice little readme here. You can click install now, and it enters a, an install wizard. And then you can select like what project to install into, and I'll explain what that is later. But we're just going to leave this as the default options, because um, we're actually going to then change some, some information on once we click the next. So if you see up here, we have metadata and then values as the last step. If we select values by going next, we should now have um, some option pages. It automatically detects the cluster type. We're going to leave all of these things um, as default. We're going to look at these options over here, and we're actually going to click on Prometheus. So if we go to the instructions, it says, in the value step, select Prometheus, and then we're going to change our resource limits. Because we're on a singular machine, this, the default um, CPU limits that monitoring uses is going to be this, but that's, we don't have the, that many resources on these singular nodes. So we're going to change this from 750 lowercase m to 250 lowercase m, and then the requested memory we're also going to change from uh, 750 to 250. Uh, make sure that that's what it says in the hobby farm steps. Yep, so for CPU and for memory, and then we're going to click on install. And like I said, pretty much Helm is like the standard that we use and many other people use for their package managing. Um, and now you have an application deploying. It's, it's essentially a Helm command because it is a Helm chart. Yep, Helm upgrade, but it's actually saying install equal true. We create this namespace. We've defined some versions like we did previously with Rancher and with uh, Cert Manager, and then we've noticed success. So if we come back over into Hobby Farm, we should be good to go. It says installed apps, and now we should be uh, on the step that says working with Rancher monitoring. So um, in the left menu of the Cluster Explorer, we're going to select monitoring. So from here, we previously have this. We might need to refresh the page. Um, so I'm going to minimize this. So we'll have cluster workloads, apps, service discovery, et cetera. But if we s maybe refresh the page here, monitoring had, should have successfully deployed. And now we have a monitoring uh, option. So if you select that, you now have a dashboard for monitoring. Um, and if you click on the actual metrics dashboard for Grafana, Oh, it looks like it just needs to come up briefly. So it's still deploying that. Let's uh, check on the workloads. <laughs> so if you wanted to check in on your uh, monitoring deployment, 
you can come up into this all namespaces section, scroll all the way to the bottom where it says not in a project and select uh, cattle monitoring. We do note that you're doing this because we're gonna wanna change that after. And if you look at this here on the left, we'll have some information. So this is saying, it's constantly looking at the cattle monitoring namespace, cattle monitoring system namespace, and we actually have 15 pods, we have two stateful sets, eight deployments, and five daemon sets. So we're gonna see if all of these are up and running, and as you can tell, there's all, all these should be active. Yeah, it looks like they just barely became active one, like a minute and a half ago, so that's probably why when we selected the monitoring page, it sent us that error. So we've got a lot of information immediately. Um, let's go ahead and go into the monitoring page down here. If you're following along, you'll be on the monitoring dashboard. Let's make sure that we deselect this cattle monitoring um, filter. So this is a namespace filter slash project filter. Let's just do um, only user namespaces up there and make sure that that's what's selected. So click on Grafana, and this is the application we just deployed. Uh, I, you know, you can, you can federate your other clusters and have it all reference the same Grafana. Um, you can obviously go in here, follow their documentation, and you'd be able to change what's being represented here, but the, you know, you got memory utilization, CPU utilization, disk utilization, immediately have visibility into your cluster. And in fact, if you are in Rancher again, I'm just gonna close this Grafana webpage. If you're in Rancher and you select um, cluster, end up going to cluster dashboard, we'll immediately start having some um, metrics showing up. So this is Grafana, it's embedded into that cluster dashboard and you can see those metrics, it's quite cool, so yeah. If we go back to Harv uh, Hobby Farm, it looks like we're good to go to next. We've covered everything in the working with rancher monitoring step, and now we're gonna go into the create a deployment and service step. So, if you remember, we talked about pods and deployments. We're now actually gonna create a, pod, a deployment which is made up of pods. So if you go to rancher and you go down to workloads, you can either select workloads and click create, and you can have a list of things that you can create, and what, what it does is, you know, references cron jobs, daemon sets, so daemon sets essentially say, I want this to run on every single node or host within the Kubernetes cluster. Um, stateful sets, these are for like stateful applications that need to be, be, be uh, basically be persistent, so it's, these are not ephemeral, they're gonna have like some persistent storage attached to them, but, um, for this demo, let's click on deployment. And now we've got some um, fields to fill out. So if we go back to Rancher, uh, or sorry, if we go back to Rancher's Hobby Farm, and the first thing we're gonna do is grab this container image. So it's going to be Rancher slash hello world latest, right? And then we are gonna go down to this first step and start listing off some more things that we're gonna add. So if we go into Rancher, the first thing we're gonna do is give this deployment a name. Hello world. We're gonna go down to the container image and the container image is going to have that Rancher hello world dash latest. So I'm gonna paste that right here. Um, and then in this section right here, we're gonna actually pump this up to uh, two or, or three or, you know, however many you want. Um, and then from here, we're gonna go down to a port and we're gonna add an o a node port, which if you remember correctly, node ports expose an application to the outside of the cluster. So it's like essentially you have um, an application that opens up a port for um, outside use, use. So if we do that, we're gonna scroll down did I see a hand, by the way? Was there any? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, so we're gonna click on add port, if you saw that, add port or service. So this is what it looks like, add port. The service type, we're gonna select node port. 
I'm going to just say uh, hello world dash np. And then it's going to have some instructions. We're going to do um, serve it on the private container port on 80. And I believe that's all that we need to do. So there's obviously some other options, like the, the high port will automatically be created for us. But let's see. I'm pretty sure, yeah. So now we can go scroll down to create. And now we have a deployment. So this immediately says, like, hey, this is how old this is. Um, we have zero of three in the ready state. And now we have three and three in the ready state. It took two seconds, and we have a whole Mm -hmm. and it will say nothing else is scheduled except those control plane cases. So you automatically don't have, you know, all these workloads deploying onto your control plane. So you never clog up like the, the cube API server. So you would just use a CLI to, to do that. You can do that or you can do it within Rancher. Um, and there is a, you used the word cordon, which was an interesting word to use because there is a word called cordon, which I can run on a, on a node and tell it, you are taken out of the cluster. You do not play a role anymore. Whatever you were doing, I'm taking, because I, maybe I'm going to do upgrade. I'm going to upgrade the RAM in your box. I'm going to shut you down and upgrade the RAM and bring you back up or do something like that. Then you would cordon the, the node off so that the scheduler doesn't try to continue to repurpose things to it. So that's like maintenance mode. So it's like a maintenance mode. Yeah, exactly. or, or you're doing forensics or you're doing all kinds of things, but you're basically taking it out of commission for a little while. And it's called cordon the node. And then when you're done, uncordon, uncordon, cord nodes one, two, three. And it does all three of them. Uncordon nodes one, two, three. So what does drain do? Does it just say move all the, move all the pods off of it? Uh huh, uh huh. And some people will do a drain first. And then, uh, because I can, I can cord the node, take you out, but not have drain first. Actually, I think cordon may actually drain you. 
drain the, the, the pods and take you out of commission. But, but it, has to be both. it has to be both. So, so the drain is kind of cool so that you can get the pods off of it. So for that, that it would actually still terminate those pods, but bring them up on another. On another, based based on what your deployment said. Do you have something that said that this has to be alive and running? Because if I, because we, this thing here, if you kill this, if you drain that, it's not coming back. Well, that's actually a deployment because you said you wanted to have three running. But if you, if you just said kubectl run nginx and I, I spawned off an instance and I didn't tell it that I wanted to have a replica set that says I want to always make sure that something's running, if I were to drain it, it wouldn't go anywhere else because the scheduler was never told to be able to monitor that. And then uncoordinate. Yep. And in fact, inside your deployment manifest, you tell the system, hey, I always want to make sure that when I do a rollout, when I want to do this kind of thing, when I want to upgrade things like this, here's my percentage of nodes that must always be available. So it already knows if I've got seven nodes in my cluster that I can take down two at a time because I've told it that I want to make sure that I've always got 33% of my resources always available, my nodes always available. I think it. Uh, I think you. I think it asks for a percentage. I don't remember exactly. Well, I'm, what's your question again? Which is the same? Apply to patch. But if you had to upgrade the operating system, you got to do the same thing. Particularly if you've got to take it down and do a reboot, then you'd want to drain it, coordinate, apply your updates to the operating system, patch it, do your kernel updates, reboot. When it comes back online, it would then, then be added back to the cluster. All through Kubernetes, using yeah. Kubernetes to do it. Yeah. 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 Look at your service. Is your service up and running? Hello world, there's 80. Eighty and not HTTPS. You did. You clicked on the four forty three one. Yeah. And um, and then we have the actual Kubernetes like cluster ID right there. So if we continue, or the sorry pods ID right there. So now that we've got that deployed, we're actually going to deploy another uh, tool here. So we're going to create an ingress. That's yeah. That makes sense. This 
next step here is we're going to go down to service discovery. We're going to expose traffic via ingress to those pods. So the first thing that we do is we end up back in Rancher. I'm going to close a store that I have that I opened. We're going to go down to service discovery and ingress. And we're going to click create. So from here, we're going to enter in hello world. And the, and the beauty about that ingress, by the way, is we chose port 80 because it's an easy one, but you could have chosen 32767. You could have created a whole bunch of things, but you would never want to tell somebody about a port number to get to your website. It would never be a good idea. But the ingress, as you saw in that definition, gave me, told me which port to use and gave me the name that I was going to pick. And so therefore it matched the two. And I said a, a path was slash. So I just gave the URL with the slash. It did all the translation behind the scenes and took me to that location so that I don't have to tell people about port addresses. Mm -hmm. um, like, how does that work if it conflicts with what I specified in the transaction? If it conflicts? Um, well, we're doing the routing for you there. So you don't need to do any other routing. We're specified at all right there. It's the same service, right? Does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense. What's, your, what's the question about the service?
Okay. So you specified blog right there. Yeah, right. And let's say let's say blog goes to some some website. Yeah. That's the web server right there. Okay. You would create another rule and you would point it to the new location. Otherwise it would be like not matched. Does that make sense? Wouldn't it be the same what if the blog is the same service though? So right, it's just like a it's just a different path and then let's say I've got like a Next.js server or something that's handling that. Oh like blog. a different path on a web server. You're just trying to specify um, on the same. Well, I guess the question then is, it wouldn't matter to us as long as your web server, whatever the, whatever this is pointing to from the original one, as long as it knows how to handle the address, we're going to send it to it. We could point it to the same one. You could point them all to the same... URL. Well, that would be a problem. There would be a. It, well, I, I, I guess it depends on who's. Where does that packet go? Does it come to to here first, or does it go somewhere else first? If it comes here first, then then we're going to follow the path here that's been defined. So the so the real question would be: Where are you defining all these other paths? Okay. Yeah, which would be in the service. So it would come here first. Yeah, it would come here first. Okay. But you, you were going to. Mm -hmm. So in your target service, can you have Well, and that's what we're doing here is we're specifying the path here that doesn't, this path that, that we're specifying here, blah, isn't defined on your web server. It's just something that we are creating that when you type in the path and you specify something that matches here, we do an automatic redirection. Right. And how, what do you redirect it to? Whatever you select in this drop down service. The target service. Yeah, so, um, so that target service, can you have URL connection into the Sure, I guess so. I haven't, I haven't, yeah, and that's what I was saying to him. It all depends on what his web server has been told. But, but using the example of 480 doesn't, without a, without a path on target service, that doesn't really help you. Whereas if you're through. Correct. Correct. And the reason we're doing this at all is because your choices are, um, if I have 27 web servers that I want to provide access to, do I want to have, do I have 27 IP addresses that are unique to the world that they can all point to? Or do I want to have 27 slashes? Uh, here's one URL with 27 different slashes pointing to each of the different ones. Or do I want to have a load balancer that knows about 27 different public IP addresses that I'm going to point to. So you got to pick, how am I going to route between them? This one requires only one IP address where a load balancer says I've got to have an address for every single exposed service that is unique. Question back there? So one of, the, one of the things he was talking about is how we rewrite that, that URI that comes in. Um, if we go back to that CNCF chart of like 200 people, guess how many ingress controllers there might be? Way more than one. And so the capabilities that you're going to have will be different based on which ingress controller. Here we're using Nginx, but you could use a whole host of others, and they would have different capabilities.
here we went from cluster to then projects and namespaces and then we click on create project and we named this stateless WordPress. Um, and if we click create there's also really cool benefits to this you can actually assign users to projects as well so uh, for instance if you've got like a project for app a you can give users access to just that project inside of that whole lot of other um, RBAC pieces, role-based access control. So if we click create, we will now have a project listed project, call it stateless WordPress. If you click create namespace, we're also going to create a stateless WordPress name, uh, namespace. You can do some things like container resource limits. You can actually limit namespaces to a certain amount of uh, resources, but we're just going to leave everything as default and click create. So where we should be is in the projects and namespaces of your downstream cluster, your custom cluster, and you should have a project and it should say stateless WordPress and within there you should have a, a namespace called stateless WordPress. This is specific to Rancher, not part of uh, Kubernetes. This is kind of what you're adding. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a tool that we added but Kubernetes, upstream Kubernetes, like if you were to spin up a, uh, a vanilla Kubernetes cluster with Kube ADM, they uh, have that hierarchical namespaces now. Oh, but yeah, th this portion is specific to Rancher because um, they, they adopted our use case essentially. They took that and made it their own as well. So we're now going to add a repository. So, you know, um, in that app, catalog, there's a whole bunch of applications that were listed. So if we come into Rancher, the first thing we'll do is go into that left menu and we'll click on apps again. So apps and then repositories. So with RKE2, when you create a downstream cluster, these are the repositories that automatically get pulled in. You have the Rancher chart and then the partner charts for apps. And if you click create, we're going to name this Rodeo, and then we're going to come back to Hobby Farm and copy some stuff. So we have um, this index URL. We're going to select that, come back to Rancher, paste it into the index URL. Make sure that we have the HTTPS URL index generated by Helm, all right there. And uh, I believe that is all that we need to do. Just double check. Yep. And then step four, we click create. So now we have another repository in there, and what we should be able to do is, let's make sure that this is the step that we want to go to, um, we should be able to go to apps, in Rancher, then charts, and we should actually get some more options. So this is where I like to spe uh, specify, um, come into this filter, and you will see the all selection, deselect that, and then go down to the, if you name that repo that we just added to Rodeo, select that, and then we actually have a whole bunch of charts that uh, are in that repository. So now, if you have your own repository that has Helm charts in it, you can actually reference it and have them just easily deployable from here. So for instance, you know, if you want, you could deploy Tetris. I've had people deploy Quake Cube um, into their clusters while we been doing these and they've been playing games. So you know, yeah, that's, these are all applications and they all have home charts related to them. 
So make sure that you have this rodeo filter on, if that's what you named the repo, because we're going to be using this version of WordPress. So if we select that, we should see that uh, uh, like essentially the README page doesn't have any chart information because this is uh, all managed through us. And so if we click on install, we have some information here. So step one, we installed, uh, we went to charts, and then we clicked on the WordPress app all underneath the Rodeo install wizard. So then we should be able to select the installation into the stateless WordPress namespace. So in step one, step one, you can select what namespace to deploy this into. So there's a whole bunch, whole bunch of namespaces, but we have this stateless WordPress namespace which we had created previously. If you click next, we're now on a, a form that's going to have some information that we need to set. So let's make sure that we set that. So in the WordPress settings, we're going to select, uh, we're going to create a password, and then in the service and load balancing settings, we're going to set a host name. This is coming from um, the Helm chart values. And this is the installation wizard is something that we maintain for the fields, like these okay. fields. Okay. Otherwise, if it's just from another repository, it would just look like this. Okay. It would look like. Now the maintainer, there's a typo in WordPress users. Uh oh. Uh, we will. So this is, the, this is what it would look like otherwise, but. But because we have a field set up, WordPress, password, WordPress, you, you know, you, you never know when you need two ends. You need an extra one every now and then. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so now we have WordPress settings selected. We've given a password to this uh, WordPress application. And then in services and load balancing, we're going to change this host name. So the host name is going to be uh, WordPress. Oops. It's going to be WordPress. The public IP address of the node and flip.io. Uh, and what this does is it creates that ingress in, uh, ingress with Nginx and yeah. So we're exposing that uh, SX7 and I think that's it. Cool. So if we click create or click install.
didn't attach this, I should say, to any kind of persistent storage. So if we were to redeploy the database that is referencing those posts, referencing all of the applications, it would be done so. So um, if we come into Rancher and we actually go into workloads, back to this, and we, we thought we had this beautiful, beautiful, wonderful uh, blog post, and, and then once this comes back up, we would actually get a WordPress application with no information on it. Um, you would have to start it from scratch. You would lose all of your settings, your user settings, it basically becomes a fresh installation of WordPress. So, to avoid that, what we're going to do is now create um, a storage class that we can use to dynamically provision persistent storage. So we're gonna use NFS, and we're gonna do that by going into the application marketplace again. Also, is there, does anyone have any questions? Do we need to take a break? I think we've been up here for a while, and I forgot to mention that we just have to take like a five minute break at the end. Or I just keep chugging along. Five minute break, yeah.
that, we can leave this all as default, and we click uh, install. And so as you see here, it's actually setting the NFS provisioner as the default storage class. We previously did not have a storage class. Um, so if you install any other kind of uh, container storage interface, you would also you'd have options to create more storage classes. So like with Longhorns, with whole bunch of different uh, storage class options when doing that, but we now have, we should now have NFS provisioned, so that means we should be able to go look in storage and storage classes, so storage, storage classes, and we have NFS here. So Check, check. Thank you. All right, is that, that's much better. Okay, cool, cool. So, as we wait for that to install, let's go look also in the service discovery and ingresses, and I'm gonna close out of the shell, because that's just giving us um, some information, and we have a stateful WordPress application. 
we've seen this before, we should all be familiar. It's just waiting to come up. I might have to just refresh the page or let's go check in on those apps. So if you come into apps, installed apps, we're waiting for that WordPress application to be installed in the stateful WordPress uh, namespace. Does anyone have any questions? Is everyone keeping up fairly well? Cool beans. <laughs> oh, one thing I would like to know, I forgot to mention because I think this is really cool. So if you were to go into like the pods uh, section under workloads, you can actually create, you can also view the logs. I showed you that earlier, but you can make a shell to run commands like right into the uh, pods container. So you're in the container actually running commands. So pretty cool and another, you know, just way to have access to all of your, uh, your infrastructure. So just waiting, this is taking a second. Container's not ready. <laughs> oh, we should also note that there's going to be persistent volumes created within the persistent volume section of storage. So if we go to storage, persistent volume, we now have um, these PVC claims for WordPress um, and it's using that, that, again, that NFS and this was all created because we simply had a default storage class that this referenced upon creation. Yeah, well, we, yeah, exactly. We deployed the NFS server into Kubernetes. Obviously, that's not best practices. You'd want it not in the Kubernetes cluster, but um, yeah, you could, you reference it via settings and set it up so it's like external to the cluster um, and so forth. Cool, so, um, so we've got the persistent volume that was spun up and we've got claims that go with it. So let's go ahead and get going. So, oh, let's log into the WordPress and create a new blog post. So we're gonna select this stateful WordPress section or the, sorry, the stateful WordPress dot IP address IO, we're gonna log in, user. Cool, and we're gonna create a new post. Post. Stateful publish. So now, if we were to delete the uh, Maria uh, WordPress DB pod or click redeploy, we should see a different interaction. Um, so we'll view this post here. So we have this up and running right there. I'm gonna go now to the workloads. I'm gonna go to pods. And if we're in stateful, we should see this pod here that is going to be referencing that database. So if we redeploy this. Actually, let's do it this way. That is a stateful set, right? Yeah, it is sick. So what we'll do is we'll delete it. So that's gonna go down, but because it's a stateful set, it always wants to be up. I just killed it. You know, somebody accidentally went in, they killed it, but the Kubernetes API, there's controllers that are monitoring that via that API and says this actually needs to exist. So it immediately spun it up again. Um, so what we should see is this should go down briefly, but as we wait, it should come up with that uh, reference to what this persistent storage in, let's see, persistent. I deleted not the volume, but I deleted the pod that is interacting with the volume. Does that make sense? So I didn't actually delete the persistent volume. 
I basically redeployed the portion of the WordPress app that takes care of that data storage. Well then, yeah, then you lose your data. <laughs> it's gone. Um, good question. So the question was if you deleted the persistent volume, what would happen? Yeah, you'd lose the data. You'd have to have some sort of backup and there's tools to do that. Um, for instance, if you wanted to install Longhorn, it's another open source tool that we offer and you can actually go through their backup volumes and you would be able to back it up from like an off-site storage data store. So, you know, we, we try to offer pretty much all the tools, all the nuts and bolts for a Kubernetes cluster just within this page. So, yes. Um, if we go back to this, it's saying database error and it's back up and we actually have that persistent storage. So, oh, question? Uh, yeah, so that's the thing is like you'd likely want it to be either in a different node, so you could do it through etcd, or you could have um, a server spun up outside of your cluster and it could be referencing that, um, you know, like S3 buckets or some, anything along those lines. There's ways to set that up. Um, but yeah, I mean, for like a highly available environment, if you had, you know, three nodes that were taking care of your storage and you had all of those referenced there, that'd be, you know, highly available because if one went down, it could just uh, come back up and you could either have replicas across those nodes of the persistent volumes. So it could reference those from any of those other nodes, not just the one. Does that make sense? Cool. And, and all your major storage providers have um, drivers or plugins, CSIs that plug into Kubernetes. So if you've got pure storage or something like that, some SAN somewhere, they have drivers that plug in that give you your um, persistent volume so you can just make claims all you need and it automatically selects and builds and creates and goes. Yeah, so like for instance, the storage, yeah, so as you can see here, you would have like Rook, CubeFS, uh, these are all CSIs that are in the cloud native uh, landscape. So, you know, name dropping, but Longhorn's yeah. right there. A lot um, of people have, so, have something already built. Yeah, pretty much these are just those data uh, pieces. So the, for the cloud native storage or there's networking, again, I'd reference container D. So as you can see, these are the big projects, the ones that are graduated, but cool. Yeah. So it, the, there's, so if you wanted to kill the stateful set, there's that. I'm trying to think if, so when Rancher deploys something via Helm, it usually brings it back. Mm, yeah, so that's, that's how, we just killed it. I was trying to think there's, some charts that get referenced in manifest files of the Kubernetes cluster that will just never be allowed to come down, like you're not allowed to delete them because um, it would just break the cluster. But I just, like, I'm just killing those uh, stateful sets right now and we essentially, this should never come up again. So we would have to go reprovision the app or redeploy the app and um, yeah, but you could, in theory, redeploy the app and then reference that volume just because that volume is still here in per, yeah, it still exists, right? Yeah, that was another way to do it. I mean, I tried that, so it didn't work out, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, best practices in regards to like deleting your application. Well, you have to delete all of it. <laughs> so you have to, if you have to delete the stateful sets or the replica sets or whatever your deployment created. You could, you could come in here and do like a... If you deleted the deployment, if the deployment created it all, you go in and delete the deployment, it knows all of its resources to undelete. Or to delete, I should say, not undelete, but to get rid of. So get rid of your deployment. To be honest with you, at that point, you probably want to be working with YAML files anyways. Uh, yeah. To deploy, and build the environment to deploy rather than rather than doing it through maybe. 
Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but let's continue on. And so we've demonstrated that we can get that storage back up. And pretty much the last bit is we're going to upgrade the Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so what that looks like is if you come into this hamburger menu, you click on cluster management, and then we go into this uh, ellipses or kebab menu, and you click edit config. Um, just to reference, oops, just to reference this, you can um, do things like take snapshots of the cluster uh, in its current state. You can um, restore from that a, a previous snapshot. You know, like I said, the rotation of certi uh, certificates are right here. But what we're doing here for this is going to upgrade, and we're going to just edit the config. We're going to change the Kubernetes version from 1.23 to 1.24, and click Save. And so we should see this go previously, like current, it's not available right now, it's updating, um, but we will just wait for that to come up. And yeah, so I'm gonna click back into the cluster manager, cluster management, and wait for this update and we'll see, it's already stating that it's in the 1.24, um, but it's just gonna give us some of those provisioning logs. I didn't take a snapshot. I should have, because then we. Uh, it's in one of these resources here. Let me. Scale it rodeo. And that snapshot is only of the etcd database. That is not backing up that WordPress database or the storage. It is only the etcd. Once this comes up, it, I'll show you. It's upgrading. Um, yeah, because there's, there's going to be like a list of resources. I wonder if we can go into the local and it would have it. Uh, clusters. The snapshot would be stored in one of these like resources. Um, I'll have to double check. But let's go into cluster management and wait for this to come back up. Cool, and are there any other uh, questions you guys might have? Um, I would note that there's, there's actually ways to do this programmatically in newer versions of Rancher using things like Cluster API, which is an upstream tool, but we have created our own version of it called Rancher Turtles, because Turtles all the way down, because um, Kubernetes all the way down. Uh, so that's, that's available as of uh, 2.82, so again, this is, this maintained rodeo has not been up to date. We're on 273, but um, did I just click update again or something? No. Yeah. Yeah, we do have we do have that ability with uh, Terraform and then also that cluster API Cappy. Um, so that's something to look into. So, like. Let's see, turtles all the way down. I love that my taxes showed up first. Um, rancher, let's see if it shows up with that. Nope, turtles. So with this right here, turtles, you can actually go in and follow along with the documentation and read me and you can actually do it like programmatically, so. Yep teaches you how to set up the Rancher uh, server itself, installs an operator, and so forth. So if we come back into here, I think, did I just accidentally kill this? We'll wait for this to come up. And there, are your guys' clusters still configuring or is it just mine? Because it was ready for a second and then I accidentally pressed something, so I think I messed it up. Still updating? Cool. And now mine is running and active. Cool. So this is where the snapshots would look like in the UI. Um, so I just clicked create snapshot and then if we, you know, 
it should refresh and we should have a snapshot that we can reference. There it is. So this one was just created. We can restore to it, et cetera. So that's where those re uh, snapshots would be located. Cool. And then is there, yeah, if, are there any other questions? We've, that's pretty much, we've reached the, the end all be all. If you go to this next page, don't click finish because it will tear down everything. Um, and if you already have, I'm sorry. But um, so, you know, this will be available. You guys can still mess with it. You can go in and like install Quake or Tetris and we could just like mess around, have some like just free form Q and A. It's kind of what we like planned for the rest of it. So yeah, if, and if there's, we come hang out with you down there. So yeah, thanks for uh, listening to me talk for three hours. Thanks. And Brian too, obviously. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> if it gets stuck in reconciling, ooh, you you could do some. You could probably just store it, restore it for, to a, a backup. So if you go into the local cluster, there's some extra tools for just the. Uh, local cluster in that apps catalog. So if you go into charts and you observe in here, there will be rancher backup. Let me see. Yep, rancher backups. So this is a way to actually back up the entire rancher instance. Um, so, oh wait, this is in reference to rancher going down. If it was reconciling, you would just basically tear it down and you should be able to follow like the snapshot, right? You should be able to follow the snapshot uh, documentation to bring up that cluster referencing that snapshot. Does that make sense? So if you have a snapshot, your entire cluster is ready to blow up, you can build a brand new cluster so the store has a snapshot and it will remember all the things you deployed and all your resources and put you back on the ground. It won't remember your WordPress database because that will run a different story. But the SMB snapshot that we did would capture everything about your cluster Yep. And like it says, and like it says here in the docs, you can do it locally on the etcd node, which Brian had mentioned earlier, or you could go to a, a backup store uh, that's S3 compatible. And then there's obvious ways to like set up recurring snapshots, but yep. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, we do. So as it stands, you have to use Rancher to then create a harvester cluster. Um, and you essentially would just boot up that ISO on some, uh, some nodes, and then you can import that cluster into your Rancher server. So let me. Yeah, you would just be adding another layer, another, yeah, yeah. Eight. Say that last bit again. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can use like, so you can always, And so 
so and if you have a harvester cluster, you can always use, so if you create a harvester cluster, you would have those bare metal nodes, you would import it into the, what was virtualization management right here. Um, and as you can see here, I don't actually have one. It's just gonna say run this command into uh, the harvester cluster, but you'll be able to create VMs, et cetera. But the cool part is then you can create more clusters from that harvester cluster. So it's like using Kubernetes to make more Kubernetes. So it's like similar to vSphere in that sense, but yeah. You can use you can use that cluster API to to bring up uh, bare metal clusters. Yeah. Yeah. So you can use it alongside Rancher. Um. So yeah, this is our Terraform provider. Just had a release like last week, so. So with the production stuff, you essentially would just have more resiliency. resiliency. You would, um, I'll show you, let me, I'm gonna unplug this briefly and then I'll get my, yeah, go to like what a more production ready rancher would look like. So for instance, like with the local cluster, this is, um, this has three nodes uh, and it's best practices for Rancher specifically to have uh, a three node cluster with all roles is what we prefer. Um, there are instances, like I have a cust we, I was just on a customer s site and they had to deploy more worker nodes to, in their Rancher cluster, so they have um, two extra nodes to manage the Grafana application because they have so much data aggregating through. So that would be, so that's like more production ready. Um, you would have things like, like you'd have a vault for things like secrets. Um, you could have a registry like Harbor to uh, have your own container images so that you wouldn't be pulling from a public repository. Um, but the big thing is like, if you wanted to create a cluster that was downstream, so if I went into this, let's see, and wanted to create like a downstream cluster in Amazon that was actually, should handle the workloads for a production cluster, let me, oh, 
Oh, what creds are these? AI. So this is referencing like my cloud credentials in AWS. Huh? Yeah, I was. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Apparently it doesn't automatically mirror. It just wants to goof me. I'm just sitting here talking. Oh. You know, thank you. Yeah. So, for instance, um, I'm in a cluster, so I wanted to first show you this. The local cluster, we have uh, three nodes here with all roles. That would be more best practices. Um, and then you'd obviously want like a DNS because you don't want to expose like the external IP address uh, like we are with the hobby farm. But let's go back and I can show you what like deploying a cluster would look like. That was just for the rancher deployment. And best practices for rancher deployment is three with all roles. But if you wanted like a production ready Kubernetes downstream cluster, um, I can show you what that would look like. You could spin it up in moments using RKE2. And then also this is going to be using uh, EC2 instances. So I'm gonna deselect that. I'm gonna make not 31, that'd be crazy. You could, and then your bill would be insane. Um, I'm gonna leave that at Rancher VPC. Um, default there, default there. I'm gonna name this uh, test cluster. I'm gonna add a pool. So now this is gonna have three separate pools. I'm gonna create a pool for control plane nodes. And see over here how it has these little notifications. So that's saying like, hey, this is highly available because control planes didn't necessarily meet that standard with just two. But if you actually add another pool, oh, I need to select a VPC. Um, I'll name this to comp P and then here. And then we're gonna make our data. You could actually combine this with the control plane that technically would meet that standard. And just click create and it will sit there for a second. And so this is version uh, 2.82 and we have extensions in here. I'm gonna let that spin up. But if you actually come into like, we have extensions like Elemental installed. Um, so you could go manage the OS. You can go create your own um, operating system that's specifically been containerized for uh, right there uh, for like Kubernetes. Um, you could use Harvester there. Uh, you could also install the operator uh, Cappy into this cluster. So it's pretty sweet. But let's go back to the home. We obviously have a lot of pending right here. Um, but this is the cluster I just barely started and that we'll see how long it takes to come up. But it should be fairly quick. Um, and that will be a representation of what a production ready cluster would be. And then Yep, because it's like leader election based, um, like finding quorum. Yeah, cool. And then if you wanted like day two operations, um, it would be like installing like monitoring uh, and, and, and ingress like Nginx. Mm -hmm. Um, no, that's literally how you would do it in like a production cluster, yeah. Other than, there's other like things that you can do inside of Grafana, like, like I said, you could federate it and you could have a whole bunch of clusters all feeding into one monitoring application. Um, but pretty much just following along with like, you'd create a Longhorn, you'd, so you'd have a CSI, like a default storage. You'd create OPA ge a gatekeeper to uh, do the policy, uh, manage those policies so people have to have access to the cluster, et cetera. So things like that. So there's. Um, I mean, first things you could always, you could always reference our documentation. Um, if you wanted to find like information on actually like 
are you talking about like how to get a up to date Kubernetes or not up to date a production ready Kubernetes cluster going or um, anything from like Kubernetes.io, Reddit's Kubernetes uh, threads are always good. Um, we do like blog posts at SUSE on what t kind of toolings we use. Uh, it's it's all over, man. There's not like yeah yeah so uh, yeah. But oh, and if we go over here, we should have a cluster spinning up unless I'm out of my uh, unless my credentials are wrong, which they might have. It's been a second since I've um, I just was managing my I A M I on uh, AWS, so I might have broke this. But yeah, um, cool. I mean, again, docs links are right here, so. You could use like container security. All this stuff is essentially more like day two operations. The big thing I like to reference is like continuous delivery with fleet. Um, it will have a re repo in, oh, let's go here. So if we come into this global tool, you can actually create git repos and the moment that you add a label to a cluster, it'll automatically take these repos and deploy it to that cluster. So if, so like, again, if you have, um, yep, yeah, it's, yeah. And so that helps with like kind of getting up to speed with day two operations, specifically because you could just create a whole bunch of Helm charts. Uh, in the moment you update it, it will be referenced by fleet. And then on top of that, the moment you add a cluster, uh, a label to this, to the continuous delivery, it'll label the cluster and deploy all of the applications within these repos. So, you know, oh, and if you're looking for uh, an NVIDIA GPU operator, we actually do support that on RKA2. So you can, you can spin up your AI ML workloads on RKA2 clusters if you have GPUs in those nodes. Um, and that operator like obviously works with like, I think it detects like CUDA and everything and gets it going, so yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that operator, you'd have to install the operator, but yeah, exactly, so um, yep. You're welcome. Uh, yes, yes, in the, in the hobby farm, yep, yeah, yep, but again, you know, if you, your flavor is like Ubuntu or something, you know, we're, we like to be interoperable, you can go ahead and deploy it on there, there's like a support matrix for which ones are, so, like, this version of Rancher, So it's saying you can deploy uh, on this on these versions of Kubernetes, these distros, and then you can deploy, um, let's see. So then you would look at what those Kubernetes clusters, like so for instance, if you wanted to deploy on RKE2, these are all the uh, repositories that we support, or not repositories, Linux distributions that we support. Um, so you can deploy on Ubuntu, Rocky Linux, RHEL, CentOS, uh, Oracle Linux. Cool. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, and then that cluster, we just brought up a whole, yep. So this one is all in the cloud. This is all in AWS. Um, and the one cool instance about that is you can actually just come in here and scale up and down nodes. So um, instead of having to like go in and add one manually and then run a command, Mm hmm yeah, um, yep, and then it's, this one's received its IP address. You can actually SSH shell, if you provision them through Rancher, you can actually go into the nodes and start running commands. 
just from within Rancher. Um, again, you can also go to the cluster itself at the top. Once this is deployed, you can go into that explore button and you can run uh, things on that kubectl shell. But, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome.
use like predetermined groups in like Azure. Um, so we use. Yeah. What? Yeah. Well, why? Right now? Oh no. We would have to. We could just try signing in and registering again, and then you could technically have two VMs that were provisioned. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because then you could just run that curl command really on both of those and then add it to the downstream cluster. Yeah, so in your case, you would want um, to build that command. So these, so all these users are referenced in open LDAP, and if you went into, so for instance, uh, a downstream cluster can have clusters and project members, and so you can actually add people via, um, let's see, uh, so you could add them by individual users, and then you can also add them into groups. I just can't remember what the names of the groups are right now. Um, So yeah, so then when those people sign in, you could actually make their permissions so scaled down that they could only see that one cluster or you could have your uh, Kubernetes admin that runs everything see all of them. Um, and so like I run into guys that they're managing all of it and they see all of it. They, they see the local cluster, they see the downstream clusters and then what they do is like for some other teams that want to deploy their applications, they give them access to just a cluster, or even just a namespace within a cluster. So, but yeah, I wish I remembered what groups these are all called. Um, lat, AMS, ah, see, so this is a group. So you could add anyone inside of that group in open LDAP to this cluster, and now they'd have access to that cluster. Yeah, and if you look at it, they should ha already like they should already have a bunch of those. Yeah, you already have like all these groups. So,
how they automatically. In Arcade E1, do we need to? But in Arcade E2, in K3S, because all the because it knows that we've built the run by itself, you'll in your thought you'll find out that there are no games on the mode. But if you want to add a state later on a control plane, more power to you. But I don't think it puts it on the mode at all. Because otherwise, you can never get work over on the on Arcade E2 mode when it's not done. Because that's it's a worker mode, but then you've got no schedule and no exit. Hey man, have a good one. Also, way to catch the freaking, he deserves a chameleon. Do we have any? You do? Yeah. No. Yeah, I am. Well, that, and he also corrected me. I almost messed up and had them to run a command on the rancher node. Yeah. Yeah, that guy's going places. That guy's going places. Yeah. It, so the control plane does have, it does.